clicker's not working. Uh, so it's really simple. Um, I've only got a handful of slides, which is really going to show you the setup um, in order to configure your access to uh, Azure uh, OpenAI or uh, OpenAI. You can use either. Um, in my demo, I'm going to be using a combination of both, depending on what we're doing. Um, and then after that, it's just all demos. So really just sort of showing you some creative uses for it. Hopefully out of that, you will see something that may resonate with you, give you something to take away and have an experiment yourself, um, and maybe come up with something, something that's even more clever than, than what I've done. Um, so how do you get started with PowerShell uh, and OpenAI? The easiest way is to leverage community modules that already have done the, the scaffolding and the hard work for you. So uh, abstracting out the authentication, um, the uh, different parameters you need to use depending on what you're doing, and providing a series of command lists that let you do the simple things really easy. So basically lowering the barrier of entry by using some community modules. The key one that I'm going to be showing you today is one called PowerShell AI. This one has been in the community for, I want to say, just over a year, but it really only started to hit its straps probably about February, March last year. I've written a couple of um, tutorials on this, a couple of blog articles that are on my, on my blog, blog.darrenjrobinson.com. So um, I'm going out to, I'm, I'm explaining how to set it up at a very high level, simplistic level. If you want more detail, you can look at that. And so it's a very, very prescriptive step-by-step -step process. Um, but it basically really does lower the, the barrier of entry. It makes it very simple to to utilize. It's also supported by the community. I've made a number of pull requests to it to enhance the, the uh, capabilities of it. Uh, and also the, the core capabilities work whether you're using uh, uh, OpenAI or Azure OpenAI. As you know, Microsoft is a big investor in OpenAI. You can use OpenAI through Azure or you can use OpenAI with OpenAI. Um, and like I said, I'll be showing you both of those today. So, the um, key thing here is a lot of talk around, you know, is AI going to replace us? Is AI going to do, um, you know, become sentient? Uh, is it going to control our lives? Is it going to be self-awareness? Um, think of it in the most easiest way is that it will not replace you, but someone using it will. So if there's nothing else that you take away from today's session, it's like if you're not already using AI, you're not already using it in your day-to-day -day job, you're not using it, programmatically or um, starting to understand how it all works, um, that's the key takeaway. Start doing it because someone else that is using it will be doing what you're doing today and be doing a lot faster, a lot more efficient uh, and a lot better. So the easiest way to install the module is from the PowerShell gallery. Um, this is assuming you've got internet connectivity, which I'm sure most of you do most of the time. Um, install dash module PowerShell AI. Um, if you're doing it from a previous version, and the, this is a community tool, so it does iterate quite frequently. I gave a similar talk on this a few months ago. Um, I've redone a bunch of the demos for the day, some new demos, um, and I had to upgrade. It's gone through about four versions in that time. So that said, the, this module is slowing down in some of that pace, simply because it's got to the point where it's relatively mature. That said, it's still 0.9 or something like that, so it's not actually officially like a version one. Uh, and there's the link to the blog post I actually did around using that. That same blog post also talks about setting up and configuring it with Azure OpenAI. So the key thing that you're going to need to do, um, depending on which path you take, whether you're going to use OpenAI or Azure OpenAI, is you need to uh, have an API key at a minimum. If you're doing that with Azure OpenAI, you actually need to create a model, you need to deploy the model, you need to get the endpoint and your API key, and then you're going to plug that into the module, and then you're away marking. If you're using uh, OpenAI, then you are going to the website. Let me see if I can bring that up here on my browser. And so in OpenAI, I'm going to drag this across to this. No. You are simply going in, creating an account, and then generating an, a an API key. So if I look at my API keys, I've got a couple, um, and basically the secret is what you're going to need 
uh, to put into the module as an environment variable, uh, and then the module will automatically pick it up. If you're using Azure OpenAI, like I said, you need to create a model, and that looks something like this. And of course, it's timed out. Again. Slide again. So once you've created uh, and deployed the uh, OpenAI service in your tenant, uh, you're creating like an endpoint. This is based on the name that you give it, uh, and then you're taking the, an API key out of here. These are the two bits of information you need to feed it into the module, um, and then you'll start talking to this. So what you actually then have in Azure is then you have the models that you create and deploy. So here I've got a GPT 3.5 Turbo and the Dali E. Um, so recently, as of in, well, this week, uh, OpenAI have deprecated uh, Dali E 2.0 and it's now Dali 3. The difference being the um, improvements around sizing, uh, that sort of text to image capabilities, the the general all-round enhancements of it. So, I think that is going to just about be it for the slides. We've shown where that is. We've done a little bit of that. Um, the key to, the thing to keep in mind, though, is if you haven't created a, an OpenAI account up to this point, you should be able to get a trial, and that trial will give you a bunch of credits to use over the period of three months. The, the number of credits you've got, uh, and now I started probably very early in the cycle of this. Um, I thought I was going to chew through them pretty fast. I was very pragmatic about how I used it, not wanting to use it all up, um, and also trying to find use cases that actually helped me in my day-to-day -day role. Um, what I ended up happening was it got to the end of the three months, and I still had plenty of credits. I didn't get anywhere close to actually using them. Now, their model has also changed. Um, they we used to build retrospectively, so the end of the month they build you for the uses you've done. They've changed that in the last six weeks or so. You basically put some credit on and then you're drawing down on the credit. I think I put $10 credit in February. I've done about three different presentations on this. I've been testing a lot of the demos. I've been doing some rag uh, stuff with it as well. Um, I think I've still got $9.92 or something to go. So um, it's, it's pretty negligible. So with that in mind, uh, I'm going to jump into uh, a couple of demos around this. And this is probably where it's going to be a little bit more difficult because I need to see what I'm doing. And uh, I need to show you what the output is. So this is going to be tough. Unless I duplicate for an extent. All right. So. The first thing, um, first thing I'm doing is just importing the module, just like any other PowerShell module. Um, it's import the module PowerShell uh, AI. Uh, I'm setting the path to where the directory is that I'm in, which is I'm already in the AI demo directory, so I won't run that. Um, and I've taken my credentials and put them into a secure credential and stored it on the file system. So the command you're seeing there is import CLI XML. That's basically importing the credentials I've got. Uh, that is for my Azure OpenAI credentials. So the first bit is actually the API endpoint, which you saw, which is I think was OpenAI, da da da. Uh, and the other piece is the client, uh, the, the secret key. So I import that in. Um, so you'll see that's just like a secure credential. Function lock on. Again. So it's just a secure string uh, and the endpoint. Then what you need to do is you use the uh, set Azure OpenAI endpoint. So they use, I'm taking the information from those credentials and configuring it in the commandlet. That's just basically telling it. Um, where to talk to in order to talk to the Azure OpenAI service. 
Uh, and then you get a series of commands um, that you can then see what the configuration is. The chat provider is Azure OpenAI. The other one is just OpenAI. We'll see that shortly. Um, if it was set to the other one, then you can set it through there. And you can also see what your chat session options are. So if you've done anything with uh, AI, you'll know that you've got to specify usually the model you want to talk to based on what you're doing. Uh, you can have the temperature, the, the token sizes, uh, and those sorts of things. So you can configure all that all through these command line tools as well. I'm just going to change my token size because I want to show you an error later on in this demo. And if I have it set where it's going to work, then I can't show you the error. It's something that you're going to see. Um, set the max tokens to be 256. And execute that. Okay. So the first demo I'm going to show is programmatically uh, talking to ChatGPT and getting some data back. I'm going to put that in a variable, and then we're going to do something with it. The command that you see there, which is you know, new chat, this is how you want to start off anything that you start with ChatGPT, like you would like it in the UI. So start new chat, you're basically starting up a new session. As part of that session, you want that session to start fresh, because then anything you do is subsequent commands have the context of, of what you're talking about. So if I run this, I'm going to say, what are the states and territories in Australia? And I want the results back in a JSON format. So you can see we've got in JSON format the states and territories of Australia. Uh, if I convert those from JSON into a PowerShell object, uh, then I can have a look at those. Get my mouse working. So we've got the states. If I list those out. Uh, we've got the abbreviations and we've got each one. So, yeah, okay, you've gone and got something that we already know what it is. What if we wanted to keep that conversation going and sort of say, okay, I've got now got a list of the states. I want to know more information about it. So with the context that we've already got, can we go out and ask it something else? Like, say, for each state that we've got here, um, what is the population of that state? So if I was to look at the object, so... Uh, just make sure that the objects are set up correctly. Yep. So, so for each of the states, and we probably want the name. Yeah. What is going to be the population? So now I'm not do, not doing new chat. I'm just doing chat. This is continuing the context of where we are. So if I run this. And we got an error. Maybe I shouldn't have made that change. And there we go. So for each one, it's now gone out. Ask ChatGPT, what is the population of that? So we've done this programmatically. So it's something you might want to do anyway, but it's a lot quicker and you can do it with sort of code. Keep in mind, it says as of June 2021. So I'm using Chat GPT 3.5. That's where it's got um, content up to. That's where it's been trained up to. So if you wanted to do something that's more recent, then you need more recent models. But you get the point. Uh, for the next one, I'm going to change our model over to us, uh, change our provider over to OpenAI. So that's where I showed you through the Chat GPT API keys. So I just changed the, the chat provider over to OpenAI, and we look at the options now, and we can see that um, I'm using chat GPT 3.5 um, and the token size there. I'm going to bring in a different set of credentials because it's a different, um, different key because it's talking to a different service. And I'm going to set up my environment variables for that. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to ask it I'm going to use it as like a co-pilot. So when you're writing PowerShell scripts or whatever else, sometimes you know that you've written something before, you try and find that bit of code, and you're trying to reuse snippets and everything else. Um, it can be useful to use 
ChatGPT to do some of that for you as well. So using uh, 3.5 Turbo, it's actually relatively good for PowerShell for simple things, as long as you're also using the inbuilt functions of PowerShell. So not cast, custom modules, that sort of thing, because often it doesn't have knowledge of it. And like we saw, it's like 2021 and we're in 2024. So the, I'm going to, the command here is like write a PowerShell function that takes a date object as input and calculates the number of days until that date from today. So date time objects in PowerShell, if you use them all the time, they're pretty simple. If you don't use them all the time, every, all the time, every time you go and do it, you always get the syntax a little bit wrong or a little bit different. So I've asked it using the copilot commandment to do that, and it's gone, come straight back with a function called calculate days in tool. It takes in a date time object, and then it works out the number of days from today to that, to that time. You can also get this to explain the module to you. So if I go, uh, if I accept uh, E to explain, then it will give you a decode of, uh, of what it's doing. Uh, takes the input, calculates the number of days. Uh, did I do E? Well, it's not working. I'll quit that. And I've copied in the previous run of when I ran the same command. And I've got the function here, which is the calculate days in tool. If I put that into, I execute that, and then I give it a, a target date of the 29th of February 2028. And then I call the function that it gave me. It should give me the number of days until then, which is 1,409. So as you know, February this year was a leap year. The next leap year is going to be four years' time. That's about 1,409 days away. Um, so this can be really handy for working out uh, little functions, little helper functions in PowerShell and getting ChatGPT to sort of give you a cheat code for that. So what if we start thinking a little bit bigger? What if we were writing little apps in PowerShell or other bits of logic, and we want to go outside, maybe just PowerShell commandlets, uh, we want to start interacting with the outside world, taking some of that and actually building up something a little bit better, bigger. Um, so this is, a, this is a concept that I did um, for a recent one, which is, is it possible to visualize your IP address? Yes, it is. Let's do it. So the first thing you've got to get is what is my IP address? What is my public IP address? So using the ipinfo.io uh, free website, um, it will uh, and asking for as a JSON, um, we can get information about our IP address. So I can see that I'm actually uh, tethered off my phone. It's with Telstra, um, and it says that I'm in Sydney, which is cool. What if I was to Get an API key from the uh, Weather API uh, service. You can sign up, get a free API key, and then you can ask up to, I think it's 10,000 times a week or month or something like that, information about the weather. Um, so if I input my API key that I've already got from the Weather API website, uh, then we can call the open weather map with the city that I'm in, which I've got from my IP address and using my API key. And we can get the weather for Sydney today. So if I look at the result of that, we can see, I'll make this a little bit bigger, that today is light intensity shower rain. Okay. But we've got temperature, we've got all the details about the city we're in. Um, and Obviously, it's actually just stopped raining now, but it was definitely raining earlier. Um, so it's as accurate as the weather is ever going to be from Australian Weather Services. So if I'm in Sydney, what's a landmark in Sydney? If I query use um, create a new chat session with ChatGPT, like I'm in Sydney. What's um what's a what's the what's a predominant or what's a famous landmark associated with the city? So if we ask ChatGPT. What is an iconic landmark? And give me a brief description of it. 
Everybody knows Sydney Opera House is the most iconic um, uh, landmark in Sydney. Uh, it gives us sort of a breakdown, a little bit about what it is and what's associated with it and what happens at that place. So, okay, we we know our IP address, we know what the weather is today, we know what the landmark is. How about we get a more concise summary around that landmark, uh, just focusing a bit more on the architectural elements of the landmark. So if we sort of continue our session with the context and ask it for uh, no more than 30 words, detailing the architectural pieces of that, our mileage might vary, but um, it tells it's a performing arts centre, it's got a sail life route, architecture it's located on the Sydney Harbour and it's a and it's a unique design so cool now let's take all of that and then submit it to OpenAI and Dali and say you know draw me a picture of this iconic landmark in this city with the weather which is today was it light rain or whatever it was saying um, but we can also say I want it in the style of a certain artist so I've got a little function here, which, which takes a bunch of that together, uh, which will allow me to do that, which is extending the library just a little bit. But if I say, I want a painting of the landmark summary, which is the concise architectural elements that we just got back, with the weather today in the style of Rembrandt, um, and then the city. So if I run this, actually before that, I'm gonna extend here. And I've got this folder called Images, and under, oh, that's the archive, uh, and under Images, there's no files there at the moment. What this is going to do is it's going to send it out to Dale. This is what I want an image of. Uh, it's going to poll it until the image is created. It's going to download it and put it in the Images folder on my machine. So if I run this, uh, and, and you can see it's polling, so it's submitted that. It's polling, waiting for the image to be done. When the image is created, it will download it. The image is here. And I've now got this Sydney Rembrandt image. So here is an image that we've generated based on context of where we are and the weather today. And probably if you looked out across uh, the harbour two hours ago that's probably what it looked like if you're looking through the eyes of Rembrandt so we can take this a little bit further and we can maybe rather than sort of maybe just getting the um, the city we're in we could ask about other cities like say New York so if I just take all those same thing again we'll We'll high code the city rather than sort of get it from my IP address. We'll send it, um, we'll still get the weather for that city. Well, we'll also get the, yep. IP, generate that image. Did you use it? Ah, uh, intellectual property on that? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure around Dali. Um, I, when I'm generating images with AI that I use, that I want to have the IP for. I use um, oh, the one you use through uh, Discord. Um, Midjourney. Mid I use Midjourney on my own um, channel on the own server, and that is um, IP of oh, royalty free. It's your IP, and you can use it. I'm not too sure about that. You need to check that. So let's see what it says about New York. I'll just run all those together um, it's off generating those images now if we span that out we should see one for New York in the style of Van Gogh um, and it looks like it might be a cloudy day in, uh, in New York today um, but again Van Gogh a little bit different to Rembrandt uh, but still a pretty good image again based on context so got a whole bunch of those sort of demos there. I think I might jump down to just doing something a little bit random and sort of say, okay, if we have a, a whole series of, of different artists, we've got, say, Rembrandt, Van Gogh, Picasso, Monet, um, Z, and we have a bunch of different cities like Sydney, Paris, London, New York, Tokyo. We use PowerShell to do, you know, get a random city, get a random artist, uh, and then generate some images based on that. 
um, we can do all that programmatically. So uh, one of the, the function I've actually written um, also will generate two images. And this is to show you what, the, what interacting with OpenAI can sometimes give you, even when you give it exactly the same criteria and context that it will give you different results. So it looks like we're getting uh, Monet for London is what it's chosen. So using get random from the artist, it should, it's, it's been given Monet from the cities, it's been given London. And um, now we've got two new images. So we've got London via Monet here. So it looks like it might actually be a, a lovely day in London. And there's exactly the same prompt, just submitted again, a completely different image. So that's one thing to consider when you're using generative AI, um, you don't always get the same result. Um, similar thing when you have a very, uh, well, not ambiguous, but loosely written prompt, you give it the same thing twice, you're gonna get two slightly different res uh, results. Um, I gave a talk last week in, in the US on using this, on using uh, generative AI for programming and writing um, against complex APIs and payloads and everything else. And the prompt that I use for that <coughs> is probably about 200 words long, because it's very, very specific about how I want the response to be. Here we're giving it like a one-liner. It's like you're going for that one-shot API call, one-shot open AI, give me the result. And, and you know, that shows. Something to also be considerate of, sometimes when you when you submit things to OpenAI, it's got security boundaries around it, around what it will actually do. The uh, London Tower um, description, um, so the Tower Bridge in London, when I first did this a few months ago, the description that came back for the landmark summary said Twin Towers. And then when you said, okay, generate me an image of Twin Towers or whatever, it said no. It, it comes up with an error, it says, you know, it's um, my security boundaries will not let me do that because it was considering Twin Towers being New York, even though it's a different city in the style of an artist, they just said no. So that's where you may need to manipulate the response in order to then send it off on, on how, it, how it will then respond. <coughs> um, and then we can get really crazy with it and then sort of generate five um, and do a whole bunch of them. I might just give that one a go anyway. So you can start building it up and then using PowerShell just, just goes nuts. And again, like I said, even doing all this, it sits. Like it's, we're not even at the price of a cup of coffee or a you know, schooner of beer at this point, and, and not even close. Um, so it's, let's see where my console is. So there's, the images are coming in. So it looks like we've now got a Paris Rembrandt. We've got a Sydney Rembrandt. Was that the one we did earlier? Uh, Sydney with Van Gogh. And here's, here's a, exactly that example. So this one, image generation failed with content filter message, your task failed as a result of our safety system. So uh, I don't know which one that was generating it for, um, but it looks like it was the last one. So we can probably go and inspect what it was trying to do. So the landmark summary that it failed on, uh, and it was exactly that tower bridge, iconic symbol, twin towers, drawbridge and mechanism. So for that one is obviously slightly different than the one that it actually generated the image for. So in terms of that description. So again, we're still talking to the same endpoint. We're asking the same thing, getting a slightly different result. This one triggers the safety system, the other one worked. Something to keep in mind. What about doing something that maybe that's a little bit more business useful? Um, if you are getting content um, from you know, OpenAI, using generative AI, maybe you want to do some data manipulation with that afterwards, maybe not generating images, you, you're bringing in data sets and you want to do something with that programmatically. There's a PowerShell module called uh, Import Excel, uh, sorry, um, yeah, Import Excel, and that allows you from PowerShell to do 
create spreadsheets, create pivot tables, create a bunch of that sort of stuff. So let's combine uh, AI and that to see what we can do with that. So like I asked before around um, states and territories, we're going to do that again. Uh, I don't think. And then we're going to output the results as a spreadsheet. And there we go. So there, straight into Excel, we've got all the states and territories of Australia um, and the populations. So this could be anything almost, anything that you want to then maybe put into uh, into a spreadsheet, uh, do something else with. Um, we can do that with, uh, sorry. So if I look at my options here, you can see I've got max tokens is 256. So this is the size of information, this is the amount of information you can get back. Um, so with 256, if I ask it uh, a list of the countries in Polynesia, and I want that as uh, returned as JSON, and I run that, it's going to be truncated. So that's not all the countries in, in Polynesia. If I extend my tokens to 4,000 and ask it again, and then see what I've got now, I'm still missing stuff. That's interesting. Definitely worked before. So what I got before was uh, a truncated list. So what, what's missing off that list for Polynesia is like New Zealand. It's part of Polynesia. Uh, and, um, and there's a number of others. I don't know why that's not bringing back the full list now. I'm talking to the same endpoint, but uh, yeah. Um, and again, you can then put that into, um, actually, if I think I've probably still got it open from my earlier session. So. This is what I got back um, earlier for all the countries in Polynesia. So definitely a lot more. Um, and then we can call other things as well. So that another interesting one, you know, what's the what's the top five beers in Australia? Get it as JSON, convert it to PowerShell objects, and throw it into Excel. And we've got nothing happened here. So the response that we've got back is beers. Okay, so then it's um, top underscore beers. Two thousand and twenty one, I think the top beers probably changed a little bit. Uh, maybe this was relatively true for the time. But I had to cause a few arguments that one. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but again, you get the point. The uh, dad jokes. <laughs> so, I'm in the business end of it now. Um, so I'm still talking to OpenAI. I'm talking to GPT 3.5 Turbo, uh, max of uh, 4,000. So what I've actually done is I, I did this... Um, this was a couple of nights ago. I got ChatGPT to give me 50 good dad jokes. I think we do. Um, I've, uh, I've, I've imported those. Uh, so I exported those so I could get them again. I've imported them. Uh, here's a list of the dad jokes it gave me. Stand that up. Why couldn't the bicycle stand up by itself? It was too tired. I used to play the piano by ear, but now I use my hands. Um, yeah. I'm friends with a lot of photographers. They always capture the moment. So what I'm doing here is I've given it, so I've got a bunch of dad jokes, and now I'm going to say, okay, get creative. Here's some example dad jokes. Create me some new dad jokes based on this as uh, inspiration. So... Um, 
what I'm doing is using another module here called PowerShell AI Assistant. So you would have heard uh, brag with, um, with AI, um, retrieval augmented generation. So this is when you're giving it some data and then you're using that data to enhance your search or, or do something else with. In this case, I'm going to upload those 50 dad jokes, create an assistant, and then query it to say, give me five more dad jokes. So using this um, PowerShell AI assistant, it's a sister module to the PowerShell, PowerShell AI module that I've shown before. It simplifies the ability to create an assistant, upload some files, and then use those um, with your you know, chat GPT style queries. So um, you don't have to do any more, uh, you don't have to set any more um, authentication or anything else. If you're already using PowerShell AI and you're using OpenAI, it will leverage the same keys and everything else. And if you actually go into your chat GPT session on the on your browser, you'll actually see the assistance that you create. And then, or even the queries that you're doing through here, you'll still see the history up there because we're using the same endpoint, we're just doing it by PowerShell and API. So the way that we do this is we create a new assistant. There's a command called new open AI assistant. Um, and this is creating a new instance of that. And then we're using that to then give it a new uh, prompt. We say, why are these dad jokes funny? So first we want some analysis on it. Um, we take the file, which is the, uh, the text file with the dad jokes in it, which is dad jokes.txt. We are then uploading that to OpenAI. We're then providing some parameters saying, you're a RAG assistant, you're an expert in summarizing and analyzing documents. They are attached. So the document that we've just uploaded, which is that dad jokes.txt, we've got the We've got the ID of where that now exists in our OpenAI service. We're referencing that here with the file ID, um, and then we're enabling the retrieval, because well, we're going to ask it this, and then we're going to need the response. So these are the parameters we're going to provide it. We're going to create the assistant now with those parameters, and then we can query the assistant. And then we wait for it to complete, which I think it's probably already done. And we can get the result. So do this all as one hit. So according to it, the dad jokes provided contain humor mainly through the use of puns, wordplay, and unexpected twists. For example, why couldn't the bicycle stand up by itself? It was too tired. This joke plays on the double meaning of too tired, sounding like too tired, which gives a humorous twist in the row. So, so what we've done is create an assistant, we've uploaded a file, we've used that to then query and say, you know, give me some questions or uh, give me some more information about this. Um, we can then take it, um, say, here's our, here's our jokes, write me some, uh, write me some new ones. Press the right keys. Why don't scientists trust atoms? Because they make up everything. Um, so this is a derivative of one of the other ones that we had here, we, where it said, uh, I used to play piano by ear, but now I use my hands. Um, that looks almost the same as what, what it had. Um, I told my wife she should embrace her mistakes. She gave me a hug. <laughs> anyway, we can take this one level further again. And I have got a, where are we? What's my place? I've got this. Um, I've got a Fisher and Paykel fridge. It's a big kitchen fridge. It's got a water unit on. It's got plumbed or whatever. You've got to change the water filter every six months. I can remember a lot of stuff, but for whatever reason, every six months, I can never remember which buttons I've got to press to clear the, the, the icon on the door that tells me that the water filter needs changing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to upload the manual for my fridge into a rag, and then I'm going to ask it, uh, which buttons do I need to press to clear the change water filter light? So I'm going to run all these commands, which are the same as we did before, but we're asking a different question, and we're asking it of the from the manual that 
we upload. So it uploads the, the, the PDF. <laughs> We're then asking it the question. To clear the change water filter light on your Fisher and Piper fridge, you need to do the following. Press and hold the plus and the minus buttons for four seconds on the internal control panel. Yes. So the point here is, this is one document. If I had a folder full of PDFs, like this is just one, I can use like get content, all the PDFs in this folder, I can push them all up and, they, and then I can query across all of those. So if I know, you know, Maybe they are support documents. Maybe they are how-to manuals. Maybe it's as built for something or whatever. Um, if you're more of an infrastructure person, you can put all those into an assistant, and then you can query it programmatically with PowerShell and get that get the information you need, rather than having to find the document, look through the index, find the page number, open it up. Um, again, faster, better, and uh, and more successful. Um, so I think that's what I had for demos for today. We'll go back to our slide deck. So we've done, um, showed the power of using uh, OpenAI and PowerShell, the two of them together, to be quite creative. Um, how you can programmatically request information, take that content, and then do something else with it. Um, we can use it to actually assist us with writing PowerShell um, uh, scripts, uh, programmatically chat with um, OpenAI, give it context, start a new chat, continue that conversation going, You're not trying to get it all with one long command. Um, you can iterate through until you get the answer to whatever you want. Generating images programmatically, and now that could be useful you know, based on a situation or a context, like I showed as part of the demo. Um, and leveraging in your own um, your own documents. So upload your own documents, search against those, uh, and, and get results. So back to where we started. Uh, AI is not going to replace you, but someone using PowerShell and I and I <laughs> probably will. I'm going to give you some homework. Um, the the ability to uh, upload a bunch of documents and query it, and then get a result is probably a little bit better than what you're going to get with just general chat GPT because you've given it the context that's specific to you. What you can then do though is also have two assistants. So every time you do a new assistant, it's creating an assistant there. You can get the response from one assistant and then you can pass that off and have another assistant that says, so if you say you're using an assistant to write code and it's giving you the output from the code. And then if you had another assistant that the prompt was, you aren't good at writing code, you're good at checking code or validating the code does what it needs to do. You get the result from the first one that's written the code, and you ask the second assistant to say, is this code good? Does it provide output on this part? Does it have tests or unit tests associated with it? It will analyze it and then give you the output from that, which you can then feed back to the first one and say, it's missing a unit test, or it doesn't return a value or whatever. And you get an improved answer from the first assistant, you pass it back to the second one and iterate through that. Say, is this a good example of this? Does this work? Can you explain the code to me? Has it got whatever it's missing? So you can use two assistants to talk to each other programmatically with you in the middle as the proxy and get a much better refined answer. You can use AI to challenge AI's results to get a better output. So I encourage you to have a play. I encourage you to do something more creative, but then keep it going and do something like that. It's been my pleasure. Thank you very much for your time. I'm just on time for Jesse, who's going to have a fantastic session on GitHub DevOps. It's in the other room. It's in the other room. All right. <laughs> I think it's all. We're on the, the, the next room for the last session. I think. I think. Yeah. Thank you.